That, as I'm sure you'll all agree, it was a remarkable film. I, uh, <clears throat> I'm going to start by asking you about um, Hungarian film, because uh, earlier this year, the, uh, one of the greatest, well, the, the greatest living Hungarian cinematographer at the time, Vilma Sigmund, died. And before he died in 1915, he, I, he mentioned that this film was one of the most remarkable and the best he had seen for many years. Um, when, when he received his first Oscar, he, uh, the first man he paid tribute to was his teacher. So I want to ask you how you have achieved the standard that you have through the secret of Hungarian teaching, if there is one, and tell us about the film, the film life in Hungary today. Um. I, th I think what is interesting is that the Hungarian industry is, is quite small. It's very familiar, like everybody knows everybody. And, uh, and there are trends in, in the Hungarian cinema that I think is, is uh, pretty obvious. Like there's a very strong... Uh, uh, long, long takes are very strong in, in Hungarian cinema and they have been like that for, for many, many years. And, if you look at uh, the generations of directors, it basically goes from, from master to pupil, and then the pupils become the masters, and then there's a new, new generation. And it's, it's really, really amazing to see, like to notice in my own work how it was obviously influenced by, by the older masters of, of Hungarian cinema. Like if you just look at Laszlo, who directed this film, he was the assistant of Béla Tar, who is obviously famous for his very, very long takes. And Béla Tar was the assistant of Miklós Jancsó, who was obviously a master of very, very long takes, who was in influenced by Antonioni. So it's, it's, it's obviously, it's a, you know, world cinema, but there's this Hungarian take on it. And I, I do notice it on my own work that it's, it's, it's related to that. It's, 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 it's the same genes. Let's go back in time and, uh, and tell us how you started in this business. What's your background? Um, it's, it's actually quite funny. Most of my family members are artists, and uh, so I was surrounded by, by, by this sensibility, I would say. And I went to a school in, in Hungary, a high school that was specialized in literature and drama. There were only two, two high schools in the whole, whole of Hungary that, that had classes like that. So I was, from 14 years old, I was involved in theater and had a great experience, you know, exploring, exploring all that. And when I was 16, I was chosen to play a little part in a Hungarian movie as an actor. Don't, don't ask me how that happened, I still don't know. But that gave me, although I knew that I, I'm not gonna be an actor ever, uh, that was never even my intention. That gave me a really, really good um, opportunity to experience how a film is made. And I became really, really good friends with the, the cinematographer of that film and also the stills photographer and also the focus puller. And, and I could not stop you know, asking questions about you know, what they were doing. So it was, it, so while I was supposed to be you know, acting, I was like constantly like, so what, what's that and wh why? And so it was, it was an ex ex amazing experience. And we became friends. And back, back then uh, in Hungary, the, there was only one film school. And they accepted eight cinematography students every four years. So it was highly competitive. And it was like impossible to get in. And, you know, you, they needed you to have a diploma or, or, or to have like serious experience in, in filmmaking, which I obviously didn't have, but I said, okay, I'm, I'm gonna apply to this school. I also applied to study photography to another school. And I, I, I took myself basically very seriously and, and said, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna do this. And uh, I, I got in. I, I was, I was, I guess, super lucky. And, and my professor, Janusz Kende, who was the cinematographer of Miklos Jancsó, Again, the same, same uh, family of filmmakers. Um, he, he decided that he, I'm gonna be in his class, one of eight. And 
it was a five-year program. Uh, very, very... It was two things at the same time. It was very, very free. So once, once, it was a very, very long process to get in. But once you were in, it was very free, but it, was, it gave us great opportunities to, to make movies. And that's all that mattered. So I, was, you know, I spent five years in the Hungarian Film School and worked with a really, really talented uh, director there. And then I shot my first film when I was 23, first feature, which is uh, obviously I wasn't ready. But it was, <laughs> it was some, I, it was, there were some great experiences coming out of that and also some not so great experiences, but it was very, very um, educational for sure. And then um, two years later, I decided that um, I wasn't happy with what I, you know, what I, where I was. And, and I decided that I wanted to learn more and I decided that I wanted to go to the best film school there is and I found uh, American Film Institute in Los Angeles and I applied and I got in and uh, my wife and I we moved to Los Angeles and spent two years there which was another two years of film school so seven years of film school altogether which I do not recommend but uh, it was actually fantastic it was um, it's very different from the experience I had in Hungary it was like a very structured very like everything was, you know, following rules and regulations. But it, I had an amazing professor, uh, Bill Deal, his name is, and and he's uh, absolutely. I I don't know how how to describe him. He's a genius in teaching cinematography and making you understand uh, the important things about cinematography. So yeah, I don't want to bore you with all this, but it's, it's, well, let's, it's let's move on then. How did yeah. <laughs> you how did you come in contact with uh, Laszlo Nemes? Uh, because that obviously was a huge break for you. Uh, this for in effect the first time feature director of this film. Yes. Uh, and and then you then explain how you, you uh, the short film you made, which uh, yes. tell, tell us about the short film which led many years later to this film. Yeah. So while. I was at AFI, I went home during the summer break and a really good friend of both Laszlo and myself, uh, a director, he shot uh, his second short film. His name is Balint Kenyeres. He's also doing very, very long takes. And we made a short film together, which was the whole film was one shot. Um, and Laszlo was working on it as a first AD. That's how we met. And that short film, uh, it's called Before Dawn. And that short film um, was really successful and went to a lot of festivals. And, and Laszlo asked me to do his short film a year later, uh, which is called uh, little, With a Little Patience. And that film was also a single take film. So it's a one, the whole film is one shot. But that short film was basically, without me knowing back then, it was, um, it was a study for Son of Soul. And back, it was in 2007, so it was uh, eight years, if I'm correct, uh, before Son of Saul. And we, he was already talking, uh, thinking about uh, not just the subject matter, but also the way to shoot it. Um, and it was a very, very interesting experience. And then after that, we did two other short films together. And then... Uh, while we were doing those, we started to talk about Son of Saul. So we actually s spent approximately like five years talking about this film, you know, more, more in detail. And then as, as things, as the script uh, was written and, and, you know, financing came together, obviously it got more and more in detail and more serious. But we spent five years and used our short, short films and especially the, the film with a little patience as a reference point. And you, the Little Patients uh, was shot you, in, res, in researching a little for Little Patients. Um, I believe you or Laszlo went to talk to Garrett Brown about the use of the Steadicam. That, that we, we reached out to Garrett Brown when we were prepping this film. That, that was something that... Because uh, we, we really wanted to stay away from shooting this film handheld. One of many, many discussions we had, we felt that handheld is a tool that's a bit obvious and it's a bit overused and something that we felt that is not 
appropriate for this. So we, want, we were thinking about using Steadicam for the whole film. And, but what we felt that this, the Steadicam has a quality that's very modern and very, there's a, there's a f f you know, floatiness to it. So we, we, that, that was something we wanted to avoid. And we wanted to go and, and see if there's a, like an older version of the Steadicam that's less perfect, it's a bit more, I don't know what's the word, it's, it's, it's a bit more primitive. So that's, that's why we got in touch with, with Mr. Brown and like trying to explain to him like, you know, we want Steadicam, but we don't want Steadicam. We want something between handheld and Steadicam, but we weren't clear. And then he was very, very nice. And Laszlo, you know, came to Oxford to one of his uh, master classes. I wasn't available, unfortunately. But I was, you know, on Skype with, with uh, Mr. Brown, like trying to explain of what we want. And he was very patiently, like, listening, listening, listening. And there was one point when he said, guys, you don't want Steadicam for this film. And we were like, of course he's right. So we were like, okay, let's, let's go back and, and, and figure out how we're going to do this handheld. And, and we, we, di we did obviously a lot of thinking and talking about how, how to make handheld work in a way that is not the way we felt wasn't right, if that makes any sense. Yeah, there are films that are, you know, shaky, shaky cam, and for, for no reason. And, and we felt that there is a, there's a, there's a beauty in, in, the, in the qualities of, of handheld camera that is basically based on the fact that it's extremely sensitive. You know, you can adjust constantly and, and you can react and anticipate in a way that nothing else can do. Like no other tool would give you that sensibility, I, I think. And that's, I think if it's, if it's done right, it's, it's really uh, can be an amazing tool. And there's so many amazing operators and DPs who are, who are you know, who, who have done movies, you know, all handheld or even just six sequences that were, that were only handheld that, that are, you know, extremely powerful. So we're trying to go into that direction and try, try to do something that is, you know, n not shaky just to, to create tension that's not there. It's, it's, it's handheld because it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the, like the distance between the camera and, and the actor is, is, the, is the closest. Not physically, but also mentally, if that makes any sense. Absolutely. So how, um, when, when you were, this is obviously a extremely sensitive and difficult subject. There's been nothing ever made like this film that I've ever seen, or anybody's ever seen. But how did you, how did you approach with Laszlo the, um, uh, how, how, did you, how did you find the style? How do you, how do you work out that out? Yeah, um, when, I, when I first heard about his plan that look, we're gonna make a movie that takes place in a concentration camp, I was, Two things. I was obviously extremely worried, and that worry kept on growing as we were talking about it, the, the, the film. But also, on the other hand, I was extremely excited because I felt that this is a challenge that is, uh, you know, very important. If, if we can figure it out, this can be something, it, it, it could be either, you know, either of two things. It could be either a massive disaster or something that we would be very proud of. I, I always thought last that I feel that we are walking on a minefield because if we, if, we, if we make a wrong step, the whole thing falls apart. If we are, you know, if this, this approach that basically Laszlo came up with, that the camera is going to be very close to this man and everything else is going to be out of focus or out of frame even, and the camera is always going to focus on one thing and that is the mission that uh, Saul has, that is to bury this boy. And everything else is going to be secondary. And I think that's, 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 that's an absolutely genius concept. And, and uh, my job was to, to you know, figure it out, how to make it work. But what was very interesting is that, of, of course, we did lots of different tests, like technical tests, and, and you know, trying, figure, figuring it out how it's going to look. But what was amazing is to see the first shot of the film 
the way it starts was shot on the first day of, of our shoot. And after we, we shot the first take of that, we, we never, nobody really knew if it's gonna work. So it was, a, it was a, such an, an amazing experience, like on the first day, like, so, uh, you know, we shot the first shot and it's like, okay, this, this, is how, this is the language that we've been trying to find and this is how it's gonna work. And the whole crew suddenly like, oh, okay. So that's going to be, this is going to be like this. And it was very, very, like, it's a, it's, that was like this threshold of like, if we can, if we can cross this, then, then it's, it's, it's probably going to work. But it was never clear, you know, it was never like, of course it's going to, you know, we're going to be close and we're going to walk around with him, it's going to be fine. We, ne we were never, you know, never satisfied. It's, we were always like, is, is it really, are we going to, are we going to show enough or are we going to show too much or, you know, it's, it's a very, very fine line. And I, and I hope that, you know, we, we, we were able to find that very little, you know, very little narrow path that, that, that is actually not too much, and, but just enough. Were, were there any points in the film where you, you felt yourself going away from your objective? I mean, I'm thinking about the scene particularly where He's um, alone with a boy, and you've moved away. Was that a conscious decision? You've left the two of them there as a little... Absolutely. There, there are moments, very, very specific moments, defined by Laszlo beforehand, that we're going to give the audience and Saul, the character, uh, breathing moments, where, where we step away to create one moment to, t to take, a, take, take a breath, calm down, and then... Again, very, very precise moments when that is broken up, and like one one moment is is when he finally puts the body the bo uh, the body of the boy into his into his little living area, and he goes out and he washes his hand, and there's a moment where we just stay back and he walks to that little I don't know what it, it's a basin or whatever, and and we stay back and we see him wash his face and his hands, and then. A few seconds later, the character of Abraham steps into the frame and immediately camera like, locks onto him and we walk to Saul and then we are back again. But we really needed, the story needed, the, the audience and the character also needed these moments of take a breath and then we go back again. Because it, it and they are very, very precisely, like strategically positioned throughout the, the arc of the movie. Well, it's, an, it's an extraordinary uh, triumph of storytelling from your, your point of view as an operator. There's an incredible operating, incredible focus pulling, incredible directing, incredible acting. I mean, these are, we're talking about the living dead, in effect, aren't we? These, the actors, the, uh, the fact that the, he can sustain, apart from the last smile, he can sustain the whole, whole of that, knowing that he's, a, in effect, a dead man. Extraordinary. Uh, maybe um, maybe we could get ready to show, please, the um, the Blu-ray of um, how, which will I think you'll find it really fascinating, um, which Matthias has brought with him, came this morning from Hungary, and uh, we, we'll show you how how that that how how he achieved what you've now seen. Before we roll, I'm just going to give you a little explanation what you're going to see. Uh, during the shooting of this film, I, I realized that we don't have a lot of, uh, you know, we won't have any memories how this film was made. So I have an old GoPro and I decided I'm going to fix it to the camera and then gave it to the boom operator. We fixed it onto the boom and sometimes my focus puller was wearing it as like a the head camera. But we shot some, I think, really, really interesting footage. Um, and if you, I think it's going to give you a really good understanding of, of the efforts that was required by not just the actors, but the whole crew and how, how like everybody has his own, had his own uh, job to do. And, and like, it, it's, it's fascinating for, even for me, but I've seen it a million times, but I hope you're going to enjoy that as much as I do. Fine. Let's, let's put that on, please. Figyeljetek, felvételkészek vagyunk. Hang indít. Borog a hang. 
7 per 1 6 x 6 Ennyi! Well, you want to see another one? Maybe later. Let's talk about it later. Yeah, yeah. So, I don't know, I mean, I, I find it, because I obviously don't know what's going on around me that much, because this eye is closed usually, and the other one is on the eyepiece. <laughs> I, I, I always find it fascinating to look at uh, look at uh, all the all the different crew members uh, doing their doing their thing. It's I, f I find it fascinating. <laughs> now this obviously is film. Yeah. All the whole all, the whole film shot on the same stock, or yeah. yeah. And uh, did you test anything apart from film, or were you completely? But there was nothing else in your mind apart from film when you came. No, so so basically the idea was that um, we not just shoot on film, but we want to finish on film. And this Laszlo was so very very clear about this. He, I remember a, a discussion when um, when we sat down with the producers, and and he said that if he cannot shoot this on film, he won't shoot it which was a very clear message, I think, to, to everybody involved. And, and, I, and I find that extremely beautiful because uh, I think that's how things should be. And it's, I'm not necessarily talking about film, but I, I really respect directors who, who, are, who have strong visions and who have very, very clear ideas of what they need. And, you know, last night I 
shot everything that we did on film and will shoot as long as there is a lab that's going to process it and there's a manufacturer like Kodak who's going to give us stock. There's not, not, not a question. It's, it's for us that this is the tool to use and this is the, this is the, this is the look and this is the feel that we're after in our, all, of our, all of our work. And um, yeah, we, we shot on film and we really went and did the old school uh, uh, workflow, which is shot on film, you know, we cut the negative and everything was photochemical and the print was basically done from the original camera negative that was cut. Of course, we had to have the, a DCP and we had to have a digital master that for, for that we, we scanned in 4K and we had a whole um, uh, 4K workflow and then we had the DCP and we had the digital master. All, all of that was done, but what, what was interesting is that the workflow was uh, was based on the on the print. So the first thing we did after the picture lock is is that, you know, we, we went and and had the print of the whole film, and then you know we basically graded the film photochemically until we were satisfied, and that was our that was our final product. And then I went back with the with the with the digital colorist to the 4K files and said, for the DCP, all I want is that it looks exactly like the film print. And I left, I left them there and they worked, worked on it for a week and I went back and, and, and basically we did a little adjustments here and there for a few days and, and basically the look of the, of the DCP and the digital master was based on the look of the print. And what was so nice is that both my grader and my, my, my colorist, they were both involved from the very, very beginning, even during the test, they were there, and the, my, my, my colorist was, was grading all the digital um, uh, dailies. Of course, my grader was daily, uh, grading the, the film dailies, so they were involved throughout the whole thing, which was extremely helpful, because they, they knew what I wanted, they knew what I liked. And, and, and then to create the final product, it was like, we barely had to talk, which is which is amazing because it was like wherever there was something that was not right, they they knew it. Well, we're gonna adjust that, and the whole digital workflow. I tried to simplify it as much as I could. So try to keep try to use only the the tools that uh, you know the very basic tools. So basically RGB, and no secondary color correction, no power windows, none of that. So I really, really try to mimic the, the look of, of the print. Of course, we had to do some adjustments because there are some things that look great on a, on a print and the print somehow handles it really, really well, but the DCP didn't look right. So we had to do little like dynamic adjust, like exposure adjustments that were like completely fine in the print, but the DCP just didn't look right. So we did that. And um, to answer your question, yes, the whole film was uh, one film stock, uh, 5219, which I prefer to pretty much to the other, all of the other stocks. I really like that it's a little bit less contrasty. I really like the speed that uh, I, I get. It's a 500 stock, 500 ASA stock. Uh, I really like the grain. And, and the reason I decided that I'm only using one stock is to somehow m maintain contrast, maintain the grain level, maintain saturation. And because it was all photochemical, I was really precise with, with all of that. So, because of course, you know, in, in photochemical finish, you, you, you know, you, you have control over red, green, and blue, and that's it. You, you can't adjust contrast, you can't adjust saturation. But it was um, something that I really enjoyed and something that I was very, very happy with. So you're hoping the future of film is still rosy? I truly hope so, and I'll do everything I can to, I mean, of course, yeah. What about, tell us about your crew, because I mean, you must have an extraordinary crew. Have they been with you a long time, your focus puller and the other people? Yeah, m most of the people that were on this film I've been working with a lot. Um, although I have to say that uh, I have I've been away from Hungary for a for a pretty considerable amount of time. I've, I've been working abroad a lot, so I, I you know I 
I try to work with the same people, but it's sometimes because I'm not, you know, giving them enough jobs, you know, from a, on a on a day day to day basis. I I always, but I always go I want to go back to these people. And uh, next film that we are uh, prepping with Lastos, we already, you know, brought brought these guys back in. So, you know, my gaffer is 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 a is a lovely lovely man, Josef Shimon, who is. You know, one one of those he cares, and that that that's all that matters. And and you know, he takes care of everything, and he's there. He's he's never tired. You know, never tired. He's never away. He's by me at all times and pays attention. And and my focus puller, who's I think he's uh, the true genius of this film. And yeah, he's uh, he's he's one of those few people who, you know, what I what I love is 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 that discipline that, that was there with film. And, and I find it on digital shoes that it's not there anymore. Like for example, focus pullers who are looking at a monitor and not looking at the actors and the camera, I don't understand how they can do their job. I mean, if you don't anticipate what's going on, you're looking at a monitor and, and trying to you know, follow that, then I think you're already late. So I, whenever I work abroad, I always try to ask for guys who were brought up in the world of film because they, you know, they'll be by the camera and they look at the actor and it's going to be in focus. They are not going to be, you know, in a, in a you know, covered in a black thing and, and not, not even, I, I, I don't understand how that works. As far, as far as you know, the film school is in Hungary, are they teaching still very much on film? I think this is still there, but it's, 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 it's a struggle as, as everywhere else. So it's, it's a huge problem because I think, you know, you, you, you can either like film or not like film, or for some projects you pick film, or some projects you pick digital, which I do, because I obviously shoot on digital as well. But what I really think is super important as a student, and that I consider myself extremely lucky, because I was in that generation, we were, you know, we were taught on film, and you know, we, were, we shoot, shot a lot on film, is that, that, that the discipline that comes with it, I think it's hugely important. And not just for cinematographers, but what is interesting, if I talk to actors and you know, I tell them, like, does it mean anything to you? And the, I, I heard so many times when they said, well, if, if I'm on a film shoot, if we're shooting film, it just, it's just so much better for them. Because if the camera rolls, they feel that focus that goes into it. Like, it costs money once we roll the camera, and when we cut, we cut. With digital, they just roll, and they don't know, they can't focus their energy on the, on the right moments. And it's the same with the, with, with the crew, and it's, I, I find it's the same with the actors. They, they love it when they have to focus, and then we cut, and then we focus again, and all the energy goes into those moments. And they also love the fact that they, have, they don't have infinite amount of takes. You know, they have four, five, six maybe, and that's it. So they, they know that they, they got to get there during those limited amount of takes. So I, I think that that really helps. And even if you shoot digital, once you learn that discipline, I, I think that really, really helps. Yes, the, um, is there anybody, let's um, ask the audience, there must be some questions. Uh, there's a gentleman there. Get the microphone, please, gentlemen. Could you wait till you get the mic? Got the microphone, anybody? Gentleman there in the fifth row would like to talk. Yeah, hi. Uh, can you hear me? Just about. Just I'm about deaf about your lens choice. Uh, was, was that shot on like one or two lenses? Uh, it's a really important element in this. The, the question was regarding the lens. So we did test a lot different lenses because what we knew that the parts of the image that's going to be out of focus is going to be hugely important in telling the story. So, and it's really difficult to talk about an out of focus image because you can't really quantify it, you can't really describe it. So you just have to shoot tests and look at it and say, well, I don't like that, I like that better. But you can't really like, oh, let's make it 
you know, more, you know, like it's, it's very difficult to like put your finger in what, what works and what doesn't. So I did a lot of tests with different focal length and different brands and different T-stops and a combination of like, you know, if this lens at wide, if, what if you use this lens wide open over that lens at 2.8 or, you know, like did a lot of, lot of these different distances, like how far, for example, how far we have to be from a, from a certain thing to achieve that, again, that very narrow path that is not too abstract, but not too in your face, you know? So we did a lot of tests and we were going back and forth. I tested many, many different lenses and, and um, what, I found that, that I really needed something that was very, very precise and very much not beautifying, you know, the, the, the face. So I, I, at first, I, you know, I was thinking like, shall we go with an old lens? Because that's, you know, like an old beautiful portrait lens that's like, oh, super soft on the sides and it's like really beautiful on the face. But I said, why, why? You know, why would you do that? Why would you make this film look like, you know, like lyrical or picturesque or whatever. That was something, that's also, that's another topic that we, we basically created rules very early on that we were trying to stick to. But that's another, we, we can talk about it later, but I don't want to mix that in. Um, so to going back to the lenses. So we basically, what I was trying to find, I realized after doing all these tests that I need a lens that is as precise and as clear and as unflat not not unflattering that's not the right word just just not beautifying uh, as possible so again i tested a few options and i find that the uh, size master prime is like so clean and clear and very very sharp that it's very almost like unforgiving it's it's a very honest lens that's how i described it to myself it's like a very honest you know, the honest image. And I really, really loved the out of focus because it wasn't like lyrical, it wasn't beautiful. It was just a, a quality that again is very hard to describe, but we felt that it's, it's the perfect for the film. And uh, we basically shot the whole film on two, two lenses. Uh, I would say 80% of the movie was shot on the 40 mil and the rest was shot on a 35 mil, which is just tiny bit wider. And the re we, we, we felt that for certain shots we needed to be a little bit wider because the 40 was just too, too limiting. And we felt that for some shots we, we needed a little bit wider. And it was like, we did a few rehearsals, one, maybe two, and then we said, ah, let's, let's go to the 35 or let's go back to the 40. That's, that's how scientific we were <laughs> with these. There were Zeiss lenses, were there? Yeah, Zeiss Master Primes. A lot of them must have been, yeah. Any other questions One, three, there? <laughs> Sorry, okay. Sorry? And wide open. One, three, was it? No, it was never wide open. Uh, we were shooting T2.0 inside and 2.8 and a third, mostly outside. Um, I'm just wondering why you chose 35 and not 16, because, I mean, obviously you're looking for the film grain and that, like, greedy look. Why did you went straight to 35 and not look into 16? For some reason, it was never an option. Um, I feel that 16 would have been, the depth of field would, would be much bigger, and that would have been a big problem. Also, we, we really wanted to uh, maintain the, the 137 Academy aspect ratio. We can do that with 16, but then you're losing so much of the negative, it's almost like shooting Super 8. So that would have been, we, I didn't want to do something that's over stylized. I didn't want something that's like um, super grainy and super newsreel, found foot. You know, I, I, I wanted to stay away from that. I wanted something that's very clear, very precise, and definitely not. I, I ne never wanted to go for a look, you know, like I, I had ideas. But I, it was never based on a look. It was like, I need this and this and this. And then you add all this, what is the image you get? And is, is this an appropriate image for this film or not? 
and when we did all these tests with, you know, with, with the combination of the stock, the development, the lenses and everything that I find that, okay, this is perfect. We don't need anything. So yeah, 16 was never, never an option really. Any other questions? Loads of them, good. Let's go to the gentleman in the black, thank you. Uh, I was just wondering about um, the lighting because it looked like a lot of it was just kind of uh, ambient light from the whatever the lighting was in the building. Like, how much actual kind of studio artificial lighting did you did you use in the shots? Lots of my lighting was uh, built into the set sets. Um, what what was interesting is that the main location, which was the building of the crematorium, had three levels. If you remember. The ground floor is where the undressing rooms and the, and the gas chambers were. Second floor was where the doctor's offices and the ovens were. And the third floor, or whatever, the last floor is where the, their living, the, the living, living quarters were. And I, while I was you know, preparing and thinking about the movie, I realized that the three levels of the building would require three different approaches from me in terms of lighting, which was not intentional, but that's how it turned out in a way. And I can, you know, basically for the, for the ground floor, I, I, I was, I realized that I needed something that's almost like, um, almost like um, industrial lighting. That, that's how I described it for myself. It's, it's bright, there are no real shadows, you know, if you go to these, these massive rooms, they are just lit, and they, they, and they are very practically lit. Like, the, the, the way I was, I was uh, designing the lighting for this area was basically, I talked to the production designer who's a amazing, who has amazing knowledge about the, the era, these act, the, the actual buildings and all that. Uh, and, and I asked him, like, and he's also an architect, so I asked him, like, as an architect, where would you put the lights? Like, how would this be designed, you know, for, for the purpose it was built for? And he basically, for, on the floor plan, he, he put where the lights would be. And I, obviously, I had to supplement that, but I based my approach on, on practicalities. So we, we basically built a lot of, lot of our lights into, into, into the set, so we could do all the 360s and turning around. So, most of it, I would say pretty much all of it is, is, is built in. And the next level where the, where the doctor's offices are and the, the ovens, um, that was a bit more specific. Like, for example, there's the operating table. You know, I had an operating light that was lighting the table. Again, very based on practicalities, like how this would be lit. And then I created ambience and I, and I and I I went for a little bit more contrasty look for for that area and when and, and the space where the ovens were I, I did a lot of um, firelight inside the ovens and also I, cre I one of, there were three ovens one of them had actual fire in it and the other two we we, we did a little fire effect with some custom made uh, lights and flicker boxes we used there and in the this, in this, in this top floor, that was the more specific light. You know, that, 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 that's where they had their own little private spaces. So that was like, I felt like, again, I was trying to base my lighting on, on psychology or, or you know, how, how these people would treat their spaces. And I felt that you know, some of them obviously wanted to read, so they would have their own little light to read. Some of them wanted to sleep, so they, they created. So it, I, I tried to come up with little backstories, almost like backstories for, for every little corner. And then, again, of course, I, I had to rely on practical lights, but also added movie lights. So most of it was like super basic tungsten, like really inexpensive tungsten units for most of it. And then for some parts, we, we used HMI through some windows and some few kino flows and then for the night exteriors that that was a big big setup because f 
for the courtyard where they, if you, I'm sure you remember that there's this courtyard area. I, I wanted to do something that, again, feels like a sp space that is almost, it's ve almost like if you were inside. Again, there's no real shadows. There's nowhere to hide, basically. That, w that was the idea. So we, we built this massive uh, softbox and we put it on a big crane and, and hung it above the, uh, the courtyard. So it was actually very similar. The quality of the light was actually very similar outside as what we had inside. So that was the approach. And then for the pit, for the fires, we relied on the fire as much as we could and then added some, you know, um, handheld lights. I had electricians running around with lights that were dressed up as extras. And it was, uh, it was chaos, but that is what the scene needed. So that was a very tough scene to shoot, obviously. I was, going, I was going to ask you whether you um, discussed with Laszlo the reasons why he made this film, and why the, con the concept, where that came from, where the ideas for making it. It's, very, it's a very Hungarian film in many ways, isn't it? I'm not exactly sure I can answer that question properly, but one, one of the reasons were that we felt that we, and this might sound a bit, I don't know, but we felt that we need something that's better. We need something that's, that's uh, more honest and, and doesn't miss its point by creating very pretty image, imagery and beautiful lighting and for a story that's like this. Um, we felt that's a really, really... What, what, what about the importance of the story itself to the Hungarian nation? Is it, is it um, something which is a, a conscience? Sure. Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure I, if this is the right moment to well, dig, dig into the Hungarian soul, but uh, yeah, I think, yeah, this is something not to forget. I think that's, that's, that's... Is there anything that you did which you would like to have another go at doing? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, it's, uh, yeah, whenever I watch this, all I see is, you know, the mistakes then, but I, I, I think it's, it's, it's healthy to let it go and not, you know, this is done, this is, I can't change it, so it's, it's fine. I mean, it's, uh, it is what it is, and, and I'm very, very glad that, uh, you know, it, people seem to react to it very strongly, and I think that that's the whole point, that, that it has an effect on the audience and it seems to be doing its job, so. Um. Any other questions? Oh, there's, there's a gentleman there. Well, let's get him first, right by you. Thank you. Hi, I was just wondering why you chose to use that aspect of the show. Uh, the whole concept of the film visually was, was the Amount of, amount of visual information the film gives the audience at an exact moment. Uh, and we really wanted to control that, like how much information is given to you. So by limiting the, if you, would, if you think about a widescreen image you, and the same size on a person, you would have much more on the sides. So all of the background would be much more, uh, you could read the background much more clearly. And we wanted to avoid that. We wanted to put you in this box where your field of view is very limited. And it's also, it's a portrait. The whole film is basically a portrait. So if you think about medium or large format photography, it's always almost like a square or close to a square format. And I really felt that it's a very strong visual, almost like a visual statement that, okay, for the very beginning of the movie, you're going to see this person and you're going to see him only, basically. And whatever creeps in on the sides because of the movement, because obviously that's a huge part of the, again, the, the visual concept that we always move, you would catch a glimpse of what you need to catch a glimpse off of. And I, I really think that by creating this claustrophobia visually, 
and then opening the space up, you know, based on the sound. It's a really interesting visceral experience that the film gives you. So that, I guess that's, that's my answer. Thank you. Gentlemen here in the front row, please. The microphone. Uh, uh, let's have, uh, let's have, first then we'll go afterwards up, we'll go back up there. Let's give him a first shot. Uh, just with your operating, I mean, you, you continue to pace throughout and it was constant. Did you find this kind of difficult to match each day when you came back to it or did you find that it just found itself? What do you mean, sorry? The pace of, of you as an operator, the pace of... My pace, my, my, my pace was based on the pace of, of Saul. I mean, I'm, I'm not dictating, he's dictating. Like he, it's a, if you think about it as a dance, like he's leading the dance. I would never tell him. I mean, there were moments where I couldn't walk any faster. Then I told him that I cannot walk any faster. You have to slow it down. But that was done during the rehearsal. But I, I would never tell an actor how fast or how slow or whatever. I mean, that's, that's up to him and the director. So all, my, all the operating was obviously based on the, on the needs of the scene and, and how, how it was inter interpreted by the, uh, by the actor. So yeah, he, he, he basically dictated the, the tempo always. So in fact, you were giving the director and the actors freedom to move pretty well wherever they wanted. Of course, and that was also, going back to the, the question of lighting, that was the case with the lighting. I mean, you couldn't see a stand in the, in the, in the, in the set, like, rare, like rarely, I, I, I can't really remember. Maybe there were a few occasions where, you know, if I, if I knew that I'm gonna be doing this, and I, maybe I have like a blind spot somewhere, then, and I needed something that I put the stand there with the light, but if I, you know, I, I really tried to keep everything out of the way as much as I could, which again, was needed, you know, because we knew that the, these shots are gonna be, you know, sometimes re really 360 degrees looking everywhere. So we, I just had to come up with a, an approach that would allow the actors and, and the camera to go wherever. Let's, we'll come back to the lady at the back in a second, but let's have a look now, please, at a few more clips showing how the film was made. Thank you.
Von meinem Klima, den nehme ich mit. Den Boot, zack, zack. Abraham, Abraham. Zack, 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 hopp. Nein, da weiter, da weiter. So take the lady at the back for the next question, please. Hello. I wanted to ask about the shots on the water. Just how you did it, how you achieved it, uh, from continuous shot from outside uh, of the water into the water. Um, we had the camera in a waterproof case. And um, we started on the shore. And as he walked into the water, we walked with him. Mm. Oh yeah, and then yeah, and then we built a raft, <laughs> and we built a seat on the raft that was underwater, <laughs> and the raft was on a attached to a wire across the river, so it didn't f you know it didn't float away, and there were many people on that raft. Few of them were trying to main, you know, move the raft using that rope. Uh, also, there, were a, there was a person who was carrying a huge compressed air canister or tank to blow the water off of the lens. Um, that's pretty much it. It was a massive construction. Um, but it was all needed because, uh, yeah, because that's that. I, I mean, that that was the idea. We didn't have a better solution how to do that. We, basically, the idea was behind that shot that no matter where he goes, the, the you know the approach, the visual visual approach wouldn't change. So if he goes into the water, the camera has to go into the water as well, and we have to maintain the same frame as we always did. 
So we had to find a way to you know, create an environment for the camera that is safe and it's also can do what it needs to be doing. So we came up with this idea of the raft and, and this whole you know, like camera and how it's going to get into the water and onto the raft and then how as, as Geza is swimming, how, how are we going to go parallel with him? He had to swim against the current so he's not going away because obviously our, our, our path was fixed because of the rope. So he had to maintain his uh, distance to the camera. Um, that's pretty much it. I hope it's clear what I was trying to explain. If Let not, me, ask again. Oh, another question coming up here. Hi, I'm just wondering uh, regarding the rehearsal process, how you went about um, rehearsal basically? Um, all the shots were extremely <coughs> precisely planned, way ahead of the shoot. And uh, Rasto did a, used the software where he basically created floor plans and like over, overhead view of every scene. Uh, and then he used, he basically animated these floor plans so he could see where the camera would be in relation to the actor and the backgrounds and, and the, the other actors as well, background actors as well. And on set, we, one of our friends who's also a director, he was responsible for directing the background, which was extremely useful because uh, the whole film was shot over 28 days, so we, we really had to rush. We didn't have time to fiddle around. So we knew that these are the shots we had to do on a day, the first shot is this, whatever it is, and then uh, as we were blocking with, uh, with Geza, the lead actor, and the camera, he was already working on the backgrounds based on the, on the plans and, the, and the, basically the shot list. So as we, were, as we were blocking, the background was blocked, so by the time we b had a good understanding of what the shot's going to be, in that actual space and how, where the camera's gonna be and how, uh, the background was pretty much ready to go. So we did the f two, three maximum blocking rehearsals. We did one or two re proper rehearsals and then we shot a few times and that was it. We had to move on. So it was very, very rushed. But it's, what, what was interesting I think, and again it's a conceptual, thing that uh, I, I think uh, it's, it's interesting to talk about is, is <coughs> of course everything was planned to the you know last detail but obviously the nature of the beast is that it's, it's never gonna be as planned I mean we're, we're talking about three minute long shots with an actor uh, with many many background actors and many many extras no two shots are gonna be the same obviously but I felt it was very important that uh, like we embraced the, the chaos. You know, we planned as much as we could, but we also embraced the chaos and embraced the, you know, you could, you know, you could anticipate up to a certain level, but you know, after that, somebody steps in or bumps into you or whatever. I mean, it, anything could happen. But I think that was, I think that's really, that really adds to the whole feel of the film that it's, it's, it's precise, but it's also chaotic at the same time. It feels chaotic, but it's very much planned. Like every detail is planned. But I, I think there's a very interesting thing going on that it's, you know, you wanna, you want, you want, you, it's not just, okay, we went there and that we shot it, you know, it's like, and then the background was doing its thing. No, it was like everybody knew where to be at what moment. So it's a, it's a very complex design in a way. There's a question right at the back. I see a hand go up. Can't see who it is, but there we are. Let's try that one. How many takes did you, did you used to do? I would say approximately four. And then there were takes that were, like there were shots where we did like eight. But I think the overage was pretty much around five. I know that we, we, we planned a certain amount of film stock for the film and we became 
like way under, like way, way under, which was really surprising. It usually doesn't happen. Well, there can't be more than about 70 or 80 shots in the whole film. Probably 85, I think, 85. 87, okay. yeah. I first came across this film at the Monarchy Festival, which is uh, where it won uh, the golden, um, uh, the golden, not the golden frog, no, it's the golden um, camera. And uh, if, subsequently to that, it had the bronze in um, Camera Marge last year. Then, of course, you had your great success with the best foreign language film, Oscar. Uh, how has that affected your life? Um, I work more. <laughs> I get a bit more offers. Um, but it's also, you know, it's a blessing and a curse in a way. I feel it's, it's from my point of view. I feel that it's like, after doing a film like this, it's very difficult to find something, you know, not as strong as, but as like at least trying something different. I really enjoy scripts that are, you know, that have a vision or, or, or an idea or want to experiment or, or just, just attack the same topic in a different way. And when you read the, you know, 50th script that is, starts as a establishing white shirt of the house, we cut to the kitchen, it's a close up of Mary by the stove. I mean, that's, I can't. I, I, sorry, it's, it's really, really depressing to see. And, and it's weird because I, I read a, free, a lot of scripts in the last year and even first time filmmakers, like I don't see, like I don't see their, I don't see them inspired. You know, it's, it's just, they basically follow something that they imagine that's how films are done. And I think that's really, it's just a wrong approach. I mean, it's, why make a film that has been, you know, like you, do you want to be the same as every other film? I don't know, I think that's, I, I think, I, I really hope that, you know, young upcoming filmmakers are brave and say, okay, I respect 100 years of film history, but I want to try something else, obviously based on everything that's been out there, but let's not f try to follow schematics, let's not try to follow, you know, how it's done, because I think that's a really just just not interesting enough. And I and I you know I'm I'm hoping that I'll I'll be lucky enough to do something a little bit more interesting than just you know following rules that. Right. Looking at the quality of the images that we've seen today, which are incredible, absolutely incredible, and the quality of everything about it, but the quality of the images. Are you, uh, do you feel in a way that you have a mission to pres help preserve as the BSC are doing and the uh, societies in Imago, just giving the cinematographer and the director the choice of whether or not they should be shooting on film, the choice that uh, are you feeling something in you which says this is, this is the way it, we, we must preserve this? I think it's hugely important and I also think that this is our responsibility. And uh, I feel that if, you know, Again, young filmmakers don't fight for this or, or think that, oh, it's so much easier just to look at the monitor and get what you're shooting or, and not really think about what that means and also how it looks. And, you know, not, not, I'm not even talking about how it's going to look in 100 years when they try to plug in their USB sticks to where and, and suddenly realize that this, the file is corrupt and that, you know, you can't play that anymore. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a big question. And like, why you finish a movie in 2K when, you know, you go to a store and all the TVs now are 4K. So it's, 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 it's uh, and we, you know, with a negative, you can just do another transfer if you need to. And suddenly it's 16K and it's, you know, you're, you're still based on the same negative. But if you shoot 2K, yes, you can up -res, but e, I, I strongly not recommend that. So I, I, again, and you can, prefer uh, digital or whatever, but what is important is to have the choice, to, ha to, to be able to say, well, this film, this idea requires film, this idea requires 65 millimeter, this idea requires Super 8, this idea requires digital, and then you just need to have that option. It's like 
it's a, it's a silly example, but it's kind of true. Like if you would tell a painter that, okay, from now on you, you can't use oil, go to your iPad and, and do your thing. I think that's, that's not right. And I think, again, it's our responsibility to, to, to demand this and to convince whoever we need, we need to convince and say, okay, this, this story needs to be told on, on film. And these are the reasons. And if you put it side by side and look at it, uh, you see the difference. And m maybe, maybe that's better. And I think that's important, very, very much so. <laughs> Matthias Edley, thank you for sharing your thoughts with us all this evening. Thank you, you very, very much. Experience. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you.